David from Cell Sword Arts has made a response video claiming that I've attacked him and that I have both misunderstood and misrepresented several of the points of his video. Now, from the offset, I do want to acknowledge that is being very cordial and respectful, and I do really appreciate that. He's even invited me to come on and do a live stream with him to discuss things, which could be a very good idea if he's willing to be honest and genuine and act in good faith. And so I want to uh, go through his video, the points that he raises, to see if we're both being honest and fair in this discussion and if that would be worthwhile. So David's video can be broken down into four primary kind of points. The first two was that he feels that I, I misunderstood him. That when he said that there are certain uh, presenters that are worth listening to, who you should and shouldn't watch, that he uh, didn't mean not to watch. He was specifically saying not to listen to, so we'll talk about that. Uh, the second point was when he was saying that if you do not practice the art, you cannot tell others how to practice the art. It's not word for word, it's effectively what he said. That he was actually meaning that it, you cannot speak from a position of authority about swordsmanship unless you practice swordsmanship. So that's the second point. Uh, he does claim that I purposefully misrepresented some video clips, which I'll address very directly. And lastly, there is an interesting discussion about the comment section and the type of positivity that uh, we would like to cultivate. I'd also like to point out that these are the things that David wanted to address. This is important because when someone does want to defend themselves, they would defend themselves against what they perceive as the most egregious misrepresentations of what they have said. There are a lot of important criticisms from my original video that I point out that he does not even mention. Such as much of his original video was to try and accuse us a chativersity of not being very skilled in swordsmanship, and therefore we couldn't really be trusted in the tests that we undertake in regards to swordsmanship. David has not tried to clarify any of those types of criticisms, and I think that is because that was exactly what he was meaning. I was correct to defend myself against those accusations because they absolutely were levied against us here at Shadowversity. And this is very likely the case with many of the other criticisms that I was calling him out on that he has not chosen to address in this video. Now, in regards to these four specific points that David wants to try and defend himself on, it is very important because if my understanding of his original video was correct, it was structured to be a type of attack against many sword content creators encouraging his audience and people generally to not watch or trust what many of us say, trying to establish himself as a much more legitimate authority, a true swordsman, than many other sword content creators. This is why I took issue with that original video, and this is why it it's important to see if his defense or clarification holds up to scrutiny. So let's look at the first point, which is the discussion on who you should and shouldn't listen to. A few minutes of Shad's video, he lays out his premise, and it's based on his interpretation of these two quotes. This one, if you don't do the art, you cannot talk about how to do the art. And this one. But today I want to talk to you guys about what makes good sword content and who you should and shouldn't listen to and why. He comes to the conclusion that I'm saying you shouldn't watch other content creators and you shouldn't talk about swords unless you fence. The reason why I came to that conclusion was that David explicitly said that there are presenters that are not worth listening to. Well, he says it this way. So how do you, the viewer, know when a presenter is worth listening to? Today I want to talk to you guys about what makes good sword content and who you should and shouldn't listen to and why. He also mentions the popular sword content creators that most of them, to his standard, don't fence, and the implication of the overall video was therefore their test results are going to be less reliable and ultimately you shouldn't listen to them as a result, as he says here. The other issue is that there are very few people who are popular swordsmanship creators who do a lot of fencing. And so a lot of people who are popular and making popular stuff about swordsmanship don't actually fence. Uh, and that leads to a fundamental misunderstanding of how these things work, which leads to experiments and demonstrations and videos about swords and swordsmanship that are misinformed. If you don't do the art, you cannot talk about how to do the art. Now, David is going to explain how I have misunderstood that. It comes to the conclusion that I'm saying you shouldn't watch other content creators and you shouldn't talk about swords unless you fence. The meaning of my words, both now and in their original context in my video, are that while you should definitely enjoy pop culture and fantasy swordsmanship content, like I encourage in the video, you should also be able to understand the difference between that and the reality of how swords and swordsmanship work. So, what he just said then actually doesn't address the uh, 
quotes that I just raised and the issues that I have with it. Because in those quotes, he was specifically referring to presenters, people who make sort of shit com content, the most popular creators. Now he's actually trying to use some of the statements that he was making towards pop culture and anime style content and stuff, that those statements were in reference to the sword YouTuber content creators, the presenters. And I don't believe that is the case. It's actually quite clear that in his original video, he's very clear about what he's referring to when he is talking about the anime content and, you know, pop culture stuff versus specifically the creators and if they're worth listening to. It's not bad to love fantasy and anime and video games and things like that. I love them. I play them. I watch them. So I don't see this as a valid defense as him trying to say, see, I was being very clear that you can watch this content and it's fine when he was referring to anime pop culture content and he wasn't saying, definitely not encouraging people to watch sword creators, the popular YouTube creators that are inexperienced in fencing or simply don't fence. So how do you, the viewer, know when a presenter is worth listening to? And that you shouldn't listen to them. And I'll uh, address his comments about listening versus watching as he brings them up. But my point here is that what he is saying now does not address at all the comments he made in regards to not watching specific but unnamed popular sword content creators the presenters that are worth and not worth listening to. The purpose of my original video was to help educate my followers on the difference between content that's made purely for fantasy and fun and content that's made to help educate them on the way the sword is actually used. If that was the case, which would be, I think, an interesting video, might even be worthwhile, why did he bring up the popular content creators uh, specifically and said who you should and should not listen to. If this was just a discussion about the uh, nature of popular sword content in regards to anime and doing videos about anime and uh, pop culture in regards to swordsmanship, I don't think there would have been a need for him to say that there were popular content creators that don't fence, therefore they're misinformed and they're untrustworthy in their tests and that they are not worth listening to. You could have focused on the video entirely on just that topic alone. And so when he says the purpose of his video was this specific thing, when he's actually not acknowledging the other points in the video, the points of criticism he has against the populace or creators, that there are presenters not worth listening to, I think he's actually deflecting something here and even gaslighting a bit to try and say, this was what my video was saying and not addressing the other significant point, the points of criticism that I was raising, just kind of ignoring them. This was not the entirety of his original video, not as what he's describing here. In this context, where I'm trying to help my followers discern between fantasy and educational content, the word listen doesn't mean don't watch somebody else's stuff. It means whose advice should you take about how to use the sword? This point in the context that is proposing that when he said don't listen to certain content creators, he's really meaning you can still watch them, just don't take them as an authority, right? I actually disagree with quite strongly based on the context of his original video. When you tell someone that someone is not worth listening to, and he says it multiple times, bear in mind, framing that there are tests that they do that are unreliable, I feel the context is quite clear that is actually encouraging people not to watch. And I think this is evident because in this point in the video, he goes on to share clips of him saying, yes, it's fun to watch certain types of content, but those clips are in reference to anime pop culture content, not the actual creators, the popular sword creators that don't actually fence, right, that you shouldn't listen to. And so I actually feel he's presenting those clips out of context from his original video and trying to shoehorn them and present them that he's referring to the other sword content creators saying it's okay to watch them when that's not the original context of the clips from his video. He's referring to the fun anime style content. When it comes to the presenters, he says there are presenters that are worth listening to and not worth listening to. So please bear in mind what is the most effective way in not listening to someone who is unreliable and untrustworthy. It's to not watch them. And I think any reasonable person that hears that is going to reach that conclusion. And so I, I actually feel it's quite wild of Daniel to propose that he was saying, keep watching, just don't trust them. One, that still is a passive aggressive attack against those creators. And two, that is disingenuous. Can I hope we could acknowledge that, that most people, when they hear what he is saying from his video, the result, and I think the evidence of this is when I presented those clips in context, I didn't deceptively edit them. This is what he was saying about the uh, presenters that are worth listening to. The takeaway that most people receive from that was the meaning to not watch. And I do find it significantly um, disingenuous, let's say, to warp the uh, 
you know, uh, meaning of what he was actually conveying when he said those things. But if you watch good content, you're critical of the presenter, you understand how experiments are formulated and you check out awesome sword channels, you can learn more about how these things are actually used and that'll lead to you enjoying swords and swords media even more. See, even in the uh, clips that he's using here to try and say that he's actually encouraging people to still watch, you know, uh, content creators. But if you watch good content, you see, watch good content, okay, the content he is describing is good, which means to not watch the content he is describing is bad. This is what I mean by understanding the context and the overall meaning of his video. I think it's quite clear when you do watch it with the full context in mind, he is encouraging his audience not to watch the bad content as he is presenting it to be. And that includes presenters that are not worth listening to, don't have the correct experience, according to him, uses foam weapons, not the right gear, and the false kind of uh, arbitrary standards. So with the correct context of David's words clearly established, that the comments he made that it's fun to watch certain types of content was only in reference to the anime pop culture type of videos, that this statement right here, in this context, where I'm trying to help my followers discern between fantasy and educational content, the word listen doesn't mean don't watch somebody else's stuff. It means whose advice should you take about how to use the sword? Is not only still a negative type of attack against many content creators, it's just blatantly false and is gaslighting his audience. It is clear beyond any reasonable objection that David was absolutely encouraging his audience not to watch certain content creators. And if we need any more evidence to that, take a look at this clip from his original video. If whoever you're watching is not able to correct themselves and say they were wrong when they learned something new, they're not worth watching. It's another smaller criticism that he mentioned that I did ignore because it's just blatantly false if it's tried to apply to Shadowversity because we have corrected ourselves and admitted we have been wrong in many instances. But he says explicitly that people who do that are not worth watching. Just another point of evidence that his overall message in the video is to not watch people who are guilty not only of this criticism, that is also clearly his standard and what he is encouraging his audience to do in regards to any of the content creators that are guilty of any of the criticisms. And bear in mind, it's still a very negative thing to encourage people to not listen to others when you're not going to be naming specifics and you're happy to just people for people to take assumptions about so-and-so might not be, you know, skilled in swordsmanship and stuff, when you know quite clearly that a decent amount of your audience is going to assume certain people and it's kind of letting your audience do the dirty work then, you know, the comments referencing us here at Shadowversity, that that's who you're referring to and hide behind that veil of plausible deniability saying, it's not really, I didn't call out anyone specifically. Case in point, this comment here under David's original video, the one that I first responded to. David has already admitted to deleting swaths of comments, which I'll talk a little bit more about later, but with him curating all the comments and being very intentional about leaving ones like this under the video, it's very clear he wants his audience to know that that video was intended to criticize us, and that is using his audience to do the dirty work for him, while he can pretend and say that he wasn't meaning to call out us specifically. There were several content creators he was thinking of specifically in these criticisms and saying that his audience should not listen to. I believe he meant not watch, I think it's clear from the context, but even in his defense that he meant listen but still watch, that is still a disingenuous kind of dig and attack at certain people's credibility in such a way that's trying to prevent them from being able to defend these accusations by not naming them. Look at the thumbnail of his video. This is why his video is an attack against a lot of unnamed but specific content creators, calling them armchair warriors versus a true swordsman. You, like, a true swordsman is reliable. You can listen to them and trust what they say when they speak from a position of authority. But what is the standard of a true swordsman? This is the whole no true Scotsman fallacy, because what that means is, is a true swordsman is whatever David says is a true swordsman which can be arbitrary and changed to whatever he's fulfilling, and he has a shifting kind of standards that can exclude anyone that doesn't fulfill that standard, and therefore disregard opinion and argument without engaging those arguments on the merits of what the logic is being presented, based on that no true Scotsman fallacy. They're not a true swordsman, therefore they're not worth listening to, which David has done in his comments. There's been legitimate criticism against him, pointing out the lack of length on his two-handed sword, and the way he was fighting 
fighting with it, and instead of engaging with it, he, he dismissed the comment based on the fact that he had more experience as a swordsman. Now, I think I might still get some pushback on this point, but I stand firm on it. If you do not practice the art of swordsmanship, you should not present yourself as an authority on the art of swordsmanship. This is a significantly different statement to what he was saying previously. If you don't do the art, you cannot talk about how to do the art. He's trying to convey this is what he actually meant by that statement, and okay, I will take him at his word that that's what he actually meant. That does not excuse the meaning of the words he said when he says, if you do not practice the art, you cannot tell others how to practice the art, all right? Which I completely disagree with, but now is saying you cannot speak from a position of authority regarding so about swordsmanship uh, unless you practice swordsmanship. I still disagree. If you're correct, doesn't matter if about their experience. If the <laughs> truth is truth, if it comes from a beggar or a king, correct statements about swordsmanship, if it's correct, doesn't matter if it comes from a master or someone who's never touched a sword in their life. It's correct. And there are a lot of observation, correct observations people can make about swordsmanship without practicing the art. And implying they're not worth listening to, but this is where the, some of the waters get muddied here because now I'm saying speak from position of authority. What does he mean by a position of authority? Does he mean speak with confidence, like you are correct? or believing you're correct with confidence? I don't think that's speaking from authority. I think that's someone just being confident that they're correct. I would say speaking from authority would be to say, I have a certain level of experience and this technique is correct for X, Y re reasons and that qualifies my opinion to make it more reliable. That would be speaking from a position of authority, which I don't think I've ever done. But if I had, I would assess it on the situation to see if it was justified or not. But even then, this is something I try to be very mindful of and do my best to avoid. Because experience in a certain subject matter does not mean you are correct in every assertion you make about it. And uh, I feel it's disingenuous for David to try and say, this is wrong, okay, that uh, you should not speak from a position of authority about swordsmanship unless you practice the art without giving an example of someone that he perceives is speaking from a position of authority that is undeserved based on their experience, because he doesn't give a single example, which leads me and everyone else to only make assumptions about what he is meaning. I can only assume that is might be referring to the double-bladed sword video where we reach different conclusions. And he specifically criticized us in that video for not having very good swordsmanship skill that, that the comment is, is there to be seen in, in exact wording. And as I pointed out in my first response video, this is where he falls into a grave error. If he thinks we were speaking from authority in how, you know, a two-handed sword should work, we weren't presenting ourselves saying we are correct because we are experienced swordsmen. We we're saying this is our opinion based on these tests that we have. And then there were people referencing that video in his comment section saying that many of the things that he did in his own tests were incorrect and you should check out our video to see how we got a different conclusion. And he disagreed and dismissed many of those comments based on their experience, that they had no authority to kind of say that. And the issue that I'm pointing out here is that he felt his tests were more reliable because he claims to be more experienced in swordsmanship, which is a very flawed way of validating a test. You validate it by the actual results, the quality of the test, and uh, the evidence and uh, logic used in the argument, not an appeal to authority. And so I do wonder if David perceived us in our Tiana Sword video as speaking from a position of authority. If he does, based on certain stands, I wouldn't say it's because we were claiming authority, but it's because we believe that we were correct in our test and we're confident in them, then yes, we would claim, I guess, that measure of authority in the experience and the test that we did, that we could say with confidence that we reached a correct conclusion. And if he claims that we should not be saying that because we don't have a level of experience that he thinks that we should have, in addition to the experience we have, is a disingenuous way to dismiss a test that reached a different conclusion than his own. And so, like I said, it's difficult to nail down the precise meaning because he doesn't define what is it to speak with authority about swordsmanship. Because remember, he says in his original video that there were all these commenters saying um, incorrect things and he has to deal with those comments and that bothered him. And so was, was the comments that they uh, were trying to speak from a position of authority that you didn't think was valid because they didn't have the experience. Like, like what exactly is that because a lot of those comments were valid. And this then brings me to my position. You can speak with authority on certain subjects if you have the evidence to substantiate that you're correct.
okay? Not to claim authority, but if, if, his, if he is thinking speaking with authority merely means speak with confidence that you are correct, anyone is entitled to do that. And I wholeheartedly reject the notion that you cannot speak, if this is the level of authority, about swords if you don't practice the art. There are many people who can observe many correct things about swordsmanship without practicing the art. Of course, practicing swordsmanship gives you a greater insight as to certain things about swordsmanship and can help you reach correct conclusions. It's not a guarantee though. And to dismiss people's opinions because they don't have that experience is false. It's an incorrect thing to do. It's a, it's a logical fallacy in my opinion. But a great example of having direct experience in something will help inform you to reach a more accurate conclusion is the double-bladed sword experiment. David did not try that experiment with a proper sized handle in the double-bladed sword and was fighting with it, what I believe is an incorrect way. He did not have the experience in that specific weapon to reach what I felt was a more correct conclusion. Now, does that mean that he is guilty of what he is saying you shouldn't do. You should not speak from a position of authority unless you practice that art. That was my criticism in my response. He did not give it a try with a two-handed sword that had a proper length grip. He did not have experience in that. Doesn't seem like he has much experience in polearm or spear combat, which is a really good kind of um, point of reference to inform you how to fight with it more effectively. Yet he was speaking with confidence that he felt he was correct without having practiced that art. And so if this is the standard he is trying to push, he then does not meet it himself. I do not believe that's it. I think he is perfectly entitled to share his opinions with confidence, even if I think he's wrong, even if he hasn't practiced it, because that doesn't mean he is wrong because he hasn't practiced it. People can have correct conclusions even if they don't practice the art. And trying to say you shouldn't speak with whatever he thinks is from a position of authority on those subjects is a type of gatekeeping in my opinion. Just like if you want useful opinions on a paintbrush, you ask a painter. If you want but you can get useful opinions on painting from people who don't paint as well. If you want useful opinions about the way a sword works, you need to ask a fencer. You don't need to ask a fencer, that's my point. Like, for someone who knows nothing about swords, um, they could ask people who watch your content but don't practice, or watch my content don't practice, and get a lot of correct opinions about swords based on the correct information that we both share in our videos, or does David feel that all his viewers who watch his content that don't practice the art should not share correct opinions about how swords are used to people who are less informed. What is fencing? Well, it's fighting with swords. It's kind of a you. Yes, I, I agree. Um, and so uh, when he says fence, it's not Olympic fencing. And I know some people have assumed he was referring to that, which is why I didn't correct him or criticize or anything, because I know when he says fence, he means just fighting with a sword. That's a, a general term. Uh, and so. Of course, no issue with this, I agree. The reason I feel the need to make this video is to clear up this misunderstanding and also because some of my videos were clipped in such a way that it loses necessary context, which reflects poorly on my character, in such a way that I feel the need to defend myself. Okay, this is actually one of the more significant elements um, to address because uh, David in comments as well has claimed that my entire response was just taking everything he said out of context and misrepresenting it, which is a pretty serious accusation. In this video he says, some clips, but people are even taking the impression that my entire video was taken out of context, which is not correct, okay? If I did take anything out of context, of course, absolutely show the proof that I did. All David is able to do is show two clips which actually misrepresented on his behalf about being taken out of context. I'll share the specifics. But what's interesting about the clips that he picks, those two clips are largely irrelevant to the primary criticisms I had against David throughout the whole video. It doesn't seem like he was able to find anything of significance. And by the way, th even though these clips he picks are not taken out of context on my behalf, okay, they reflect what the intention was with them. But even if they were, according to his opinion, those are the only two things he can find to try and say that I took them out of context when he has been saying, in comments and elsewhere, that my entire response video was taking him out of context. But there are only these two examples, flawed examples, that he is able to present. And so uh, 
the primary criticisms I had against him absolutely not only were in context, I think they are more correctly in context than what he is trying to reframe the meaning of. Remember who, what he was referring to when he says should and shouldn't listen to and now he's trying to say, you know, when I say listen, also watch, it's pretty clear what he meant. Okay, so I think his trying to reframing the meaning here takes something out of context where I was presenting his meaning very accurate to what he was saying in the video. The first clip is me test cutting. So I think the problem that we see when people are trying to justify this is they do test cuts on inanimate objects. All right, so the reason why I now show these two clips in response to that was to present, prove that the people he was referring to in his double-bladed sword video, that they get things wrong because he says they do cuts against inanimate objects, and then he also says use foam swords, I show us in our double later sword video, test cutting against the animal object to prove that, yeah, he's referring to us when he says that. And then I just tack on the little thing to show that he also does test cuts against inanimate objects, okay? This does not invalidate people doing tests. He was trying to present that doing test cuts against inanimate objects invalidated our double-bladed sword test, all right? Now, I presented his clip not to say that when he does test cuts against inanimate objects, he uses them to validate his tests. No, I presented his clip to show that even he believes test cutting against inanimate objects does not invalidate certain tests or the utility of certain weapons, okay? We were test cutting with a double-bladed sword to see how effectively you would be able to cut with it in the exact same way that he does. He does test cuts with a sword to see how effectively this sword can cut. We weren't saying because it can cut an inanimate object is therefore a functional, fully effective weapon that we, we established that in the actual sparring. That was just to establish if you could use it as a cutting weapon. And so please pay attention that he was trying to dismiss some of the validity of our conclusions because we were cutting as an inanimate object when we weren't doing that in the video. We're just seeing if it could cut. We weren't saying it's going to be a viable. There are many weapons that can cut well that we say in terms of utility and function are still crap, all right? The cutting is just to see if it can function as an effective weapon and do damage. That's the standard, yet it seemed like he was trying to present us doing that as a means to discredit the test. And so therefore I showed a clip of him cutting things to show that of course he cuts things and that does not invalidate certain conclusions. And it's being used in Shad's video to prove that I do tests to test out whether a technique works or not against an inanimate object. See, what he says then is 100% false. I never presented that in the video. Let's listen to it again. And it's being used in Shad's video to prove that I do tests to test out whether a technique works or not against an inanimate object. He's claiming that I presented that Soul Sword Arts does tests against inanimate objects to prove if a technique works. I never ever even said that or implied it, all right? You can look through the entire video and trust me, if there was a clip of me saying that, I think he would have used the clip. He is literally saying, I proposed something to my audience that I never did. Listen to the wording. But to prove that I do tests to test out whether a technique works or not against an inanimate object. I never said he does tests against an inanimate object to prove if a technique works or not. No, 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 no. The clip is there to simply show that when you cut against an inanimate object that does not invalidate other conclusions you have about a certain weapon as he does and as we did as well. It's a very comparable one-to-one -one example of what we did and what he does in a very equivalent way, but is now trying to reframe it entirely to say something that I never said at all. However, test cutting isn't to prove whether a technique works. It's simply a test of edge alignment. Again, did we use the test cutting to establish if the double-bladed sword was effective in combat or if you would be able to cut well with it and do damage against an opponent, all right? Because those are two separate things. You can have a weapon that can do damage against an opponent, nunchucks, but an actual use in combat might not be as effective. That's kind of a, a comparison and balance that I have been pretty consistent with when I'm reviewing weapons. Also, please bear in mind, edge alignment with a double-bladed sword is very difficult. We discovered that. It's difficult. And it, it might have been too difficult to make it viable in combat, but we were able to make it work. That was the value of those test cutting against inanimate objects. If, if you can actually maintain edge alignment in striking with such an awkward, large, cumbersome weapon, which we could. So there's absolutely value in the test, but we weren't validating the technique of it in combat. We're trying to validate if it could be an effective damage dealing weapon. Additionally, this is one of, if not the first times that I ever cut. I feel it's very important for me to show both my successes and my failures. So I added the clip of him failing the cut because there are examples of us succeeding in our technique and failing in our techniques. And when he is presenting himself as a true swordsman, 
is also not perfect, okay? He says that in this video, but I just wanted to, I put that in the video also to kind of just emphasize that as well, that he's presenting, remember, the premise of his video was that he is a true swordsman. And because of that, his opinions are were more trustworthy. That is what he was presenting in the original video. You can watch it, it's quite clear. But what is a true swordsman? He's not perfect, he makes mistakes, we make mistakes, and at the same time, he made some big mistakes and false, you know, assumptions about the double-bladed sword. But he's saying because he's a true swordsman, he was able, his conclusions were more correct. It's not the case. It's just one little clip to show that, yeah, we're all imperfect. The second clip that Chad uses is one of me using a foam sword after I make the point that foam swords are not a good approximation of steel swords and shouldn't really be used for a test of whether or not a technique works. However, this clip's taken out of context because in the video that he's showing a clip from, I very explicitly at the beginning and the end talk about how this is not a true test of this technique. This is interesting because he claims that I cut out the context of him saying foam swords are not a good substitute for real swords, therefore misrepresenting him. when I I was explicit that that was his position right here in the video. He says that they need to be using proper gear and steel swords. And if you don't use steel swords, uh, well, in the video he says less validity or something along those lines because he knows his used foam swords in his tests. Although in previous comments, before he realized that there are sometimes you need to use foam swords, he says that Tests with foam swords are basically useless. There's the exact wording right there. So he has come to realize that, no, there are times when foam swords can actually give legitimate, valid information, only if you acknowledge it. And if you don't acknowledge it, it seems like everything that uh, is used or taught with foam swords are less reliable. In this video, he says, because his since done foam weapon tests, mm -hmm. that you can gain some valid feedback and information if you but then he says it's more trustworthy when people tell you that you're using foam weapons and it's not going to be a one-to-one -one analog because you can still get some feedback mm -hmm. and it's safe it's easy it's fun and so we're happy to use it david seems to acknowledge that now but he seems to think that you have to uh, be so hyper focused that it's not steel in a way that it's not obvious when it clearly is. And so the reason why I cut out him saying it was because it wasn't needed, because I explicitly address that point. So, so I don't understand what he's trying to claim I'm trying to misrepresent about his stance at all. I explicitly state what his position are in fo about foam swords in regards to tests, okay? I also acknowledge that he, well, that's the point that I point out. He also uses them, and so you can gain some validity out of them. But I was also very clear that he doesn't think they're perfect, and certain tests will lose a level of validity in using foam swords. That's his stance, and I state that stance. But now he's trying to say that I'm deceptively trying to hide his position on foam swords because I didn't include the point when he said it after the clip that I shared in the video when the purpose of me sharing that clip wasn't to actually address his position on foam swords. We address that later in the video and that's where I mentioned what his stance is. The purpose of that clip was to show that in that specific point right there, yeah, he also uses foam swords. So clearly there's something outside the position that he has held with different levels of, I guess, criticism of about, about foam swords, that even he believes there's still validity you can find in using them. I show a clip of us using the foam swords to prove that yes, he's referring to us in the double-bladed sword. And then I show a clip of him doing the same, okay? Not taking out the context that he views where they could be valid because I state that later in the video explicitly. And this is why I think it's particularly disingenuous what he's doing, because in the two clips in which he's trying to claim I've taken him out of context, I didn't. Not at all. And yet he has been saying that my entire response video was taking everything out of context and misrepresenting him in every way, therefore it was all invalid. He's said that in comments and other places. And yet the only two examples he can share are these two, which are still falsely presented because I'm not taking him out of context in the use of those clips in any way. So if David has an actual clip of me taking him out of context, I would invite him to share it. And if it's correct, if I misunderstood something, I'll acknowledge it and correct myself. But these two are not at all. And I find it disingenuous that he is uh, putting so much attention and misrepresenting something as me disingenuously, falsely presenting his views on it by not sharing lengthy comments 
about something that I acknowledge and state accurately what his position is later in the video. I've made multiple videos talking about how I love foam swords and I use them all the time in my training, but they are not steel and they are not a good approximation for when you're testing whether or not a technique is viable or not. I disagree with that. They can be a good approximation in testing whether a technique is viable or not. Of course, they're not perfect, but to give you a good baseline, they can be perfectly adequate for it, okay? And so to try and disregard what he seems to be, uh, he's saying they're not a good approximate to test if whether a technique is valid or not. We double tested it with a steel double-bladed longsword, and in actual fact, the steel one reinforced our conclusions that we used with foam. Foam can be adequate to reach interesting conclusions, uh, give you, point you in the right direction. They're not perfect, I've acknowledged that multiple times, we <laughs> caveat that in many videos, but to disregard them entirely, well, he doesn't do that, and this is what confused me, because he says they're not good approximations to whether a technique can work or not, but they're good enough for him to test in the sword, even though he had caveated that they're not perfect. If they were not good enough, he couldn't get any valid information, he wouldn't have even used them in the first place. And so I think he's contradicting himself when he says this, that they're not good approximations, they're good enough. They were good enough in his sword video, and there are a lot of cases where they are good enough in reaching valid conclusions. So those are the primary rebuttals in his video, and honestly, look, I don't think that they are completely honest or very valid. I think in some cases, he's actually being quite dishonest. But the biggest, uh, I guess, sign of dishonesty is what he says now. Now, in regards to comments, all right, this wasn't my intention to try and send over a horde of hate comments. People will do what they do. In fact, I was very clear about people watching your content and trying to support you as a creator. But people are going to reach conclusions. I presented your video in context very clearly about the meaning of what you were saying. I thought it was very disagreeable, and there are a number of people that got even further upset, all right? This is the thing. There have been a number of people being upset with me based on how you've presented my own comments and have said really hateful things in my... So it, it clearly goes both ways. We can't control perfectly what our audience does. We can only encourage. But when you start to curate comments to a very large degree, that does start to say something. And I'll share exactly what that's saying in just a moment. We've been getting hundreds of comments that are inappropriate, slurs, and other things that are not allowed on my PG channel. I'm out in public, I go to a lot of events, tournaments, renaissance festivals, workshops, and I meet my fans, and I don't want to be associated with that kind of negativity. David, if you don't want to be associated with this type of negativity, why then have you left what you would probably consider very toxic comments and remarks about me in your comment section? Okay, if you didn't want to be associated with this type of negativity, with this type of, uh, you know, uh, criticism, I want to say, because some of them are, are very mean-spirited, right? It seems like what you're saying here is completely untrue. You actually don't seem to have an issue with toxicity and things being mean-spirited when it's not directed at you. It's still in your comment section. In fact, we have a couple of examples. So when David says that he doesn't want inappropriate things, slurs, and negativity in his comment sections, I think he should be holding himself to that same standard and especially not engage in it himself. But as we see here, in response to a comment that was critical of him, he says, your comment is nothing but empty chest something. What action do you actually want me to take? I'm not admitting fault or something that I didn't do. I stand by everything I said in my video. If you misrepresent it, that's your own fault. That is just one of the many times he says that I was just misrepresenting him in my reply video. In response to him though, Phoenix Blaze 1776 says, doesn't pass the sniff test. David responds with, your mum didn't pass the sniff test, but that didn't stop me. Hmm, interesting way to avoid negativity and toxicity in your own comment section. And I don't want to be associated with that kind of negativity. And is engaged in this type of negativity quite a lot. A lot to comments that is now deleted because it was reflecting very poorly on him. People were starting to comment that his behavior in the comment section was quite deplorable and that they were unsubscribing as a result and he wiped out a good lot of them but there's still ones up there like you know when someone look and it's a critical comment man led but if he didn't want that neg negativity he could have just deleted that comment instead he says your mum didn't complain him just adding to it someone calls him a hypocrite he tells them they're a sheep and then there are comments being really nasty about me and our audience here at Shadowversity which he not only has left up, because this is the thing, when you're going to curate your comments to this level, okay, what you get rid of, and by the way, getting rid of really bad toxic comments, okay, I actually understand that, all right? 
But when you start to curate it to this level and deleting many comments of legitimate criticism, and that's been one of the, some of the pushback, is that people are saying, no, no, you haven't just been deleting toxic comments. There's been people, you know, sending me messages that they said very polite criticisms, just saying, hey, what about this, that? And then they got, not, their comment not only deleted, then they got banned from the channel as well. And so him claiming that it's just been these toxic comments is a lie. And then the claim that he is trying to only keep it positive and not have negativity and not have inappropriate things because he wants to keep it PG. This is also just a flat lie. That's not the case. There are some very inappropriate comments, really nasty comments. And let me be clear, I perfectly understand the need to delete some of the most nasty comments. I do that myself. But with the exception of the most extreme circumstances, I always leave the vast majority of comments up, even the ones criticizing me, as you will find many under my response video. The issue at play here is when you start deleting most of the comments, especially the ones giving valid criticism that are not being toxic in any way, to the point where you are curating the comment section and then trying to justify it by saying most of the deleted comments were just slurs, toxic, and you don't want to be associated with that negativity when you actively participate with that negativity, spread it, and are perfectly fine with negative comments staying up when it's just not directed at you. And so deleting comments is one thing, but the comments you leave up also says something. And it's very clear that David, not only have you been leaving up positive comments, and I get that as well, but it's your claim of you don't want to partake in this type of negativity, yet you will leave up really negative comments about people you disagree with, even really nice ones, even hearting, signal boosting and endorsing some vile comments about me, means his being not only a complete hypocrite here, I've been very reluctant to say anything negatively about David's character, okay? I've criticized his arguments, I've encouraged people to watch him. I have to say though, in this instance of him trying to present himself as this standard of virtue of only wanting to be part in positivity and stuff, compared to the way he's behaving and the type of comments that he has not only said and signal boosted, he is just full of it in regards to how he's trying to present himself and what he's saying at this point right here. And I don't want to be associated with that kind of negativity. My YouTube is supposed to be a positive and family-friendly place. Case in point, here's a comment that you hearted. What does it mean when you heart a comment? It means you loved the comment, which is an endorsement of that comment, okay? He echoes the sentiments. Man, it is absolutely wild how someone as insecure and as demonstrably bad at everything he does as Shad can cultivate such a psychotically devoted cult that will descend like a howling pack of lunatics on anyone that they deem has insulted their great leader. The comment goes on, but it's uh, wild with how not only disingenuous it is, but how aggressively critical it is, mean-spirited it is, to my audience, you my fans, okay? The fact that David would heart a comment like this, I think says quite a decent amount about his true attitude regarding this, his true intents, and if he is actually wanting to approach this in good faith, and his true feelings about me and our audience here at Shadowversity. Indeed, this comment right here was very revealing in a very disappointing way. Uh, someone says, I wasn't subscribed before, and now I never will be. You're not a very cool person. Now, in terms of you know, negativity and criticism. It's not that bad. I've received far, far worse. His response was, you've got a Trump profile picture. I'm honestly glad that you're gone. That one I find just so, just <laughs> awful, okay? I want to make very clear, regardless of what you believe, you disagree with me, agree, who you, your political opinions, your religious opinions, if you follow Trump, if you hate Trump, if you follow Biden or hate Biden, you are welcome here on Shadowversity, and I value you as a viewer and subscriber. And I find it a loss when anyone leaves, especially if it's because we might disagree over something as silly in the larger scheme of things as what politician you support, okay? It genuinely seems like that David doesn't want a very large amount of people that might be on a different political spectrum or aisle to him to even bother watching his content. That's awful, okay? I, I would hope we could be more accepting uh, and tolerant of other people, all right, and be happy to have people from every walk of life, different lifestyles, different political leanings, to watch our content and be happy for it. And it's comments like this that reflect a very poor attitude, which leads me to an ultimate conclusion in regards to his invitation to want to perhaps collaborate and even have a live stream. 
I don't think David is acting in good faith here. I do not think he's being honest, especially in comments like this. And I don't want to be associated with that kind of negativity. My YouTube is supposed to be a positive and family-friendly place where he is trying to present himself as wanting to be a beacon of positivity and not wanting such negativity in his comment section because of keeping things clean for his audience stuff. And then not only <laughs> engaging in it, but signal boosting that very type of behavior he's saying he doesn't want. That is just blatant latent dishonesty right there and so all of the criticisms and rebuttals in this video are false either poorly framed or flatly misrepresented and it doesn't give me confidence in trying to chat with him about this if he's going to show honestly a better attitude going into the future i wish him all the best and then honestly yeah maybe we'll be able to chat in the future but currently the attitude he has shown now the level of uh, culpability and responsibility he is showing for when you know there is fair criticism being raised against him doesn't encourage me to want to engage any further, okay? So he might respond to this, I don't feel too much uh, motivation to keep things going at all. I wanted to respond to this because uh, what he was saying was incorrect and needed to be uh, addressed. And that's kind of where hopefully I'll leave it. I can't guarantee it though, we'll see what happens in the future. But I might leave this video with these words right here. If whoever you're watching is not able to correct themselves and say they were wrong when they learned something new, they're not worth watching. And remember, for what standard that you hold other people to, that should be the standard that people hold you to as well.